Okay, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel speakers this afternoon. To my right, uh, I'm joined by the Minister for Transport, Dato Liao Cheong Lai. Thank you. And uh, to Mr. Dato Sri is right there, we, uh, we have uh, Uwe Kruger, who is the uh, Chief Executive Officer of a massive engineering and design consultant service firm, W. Atkins. And around here, we have uh, Chris Heathcote, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Global Infrastructure Hub, based in Sint, Sydney, which is a G20 initiative. And then finally, we have Stephen Grove, who's the Vice President East Asia, Southeast Asia, and Pacific at the Asian Development Bank. Gentlemen, welcome to the panel discussion. Okay, if we can begin uh, today with uh, Transport Minister Dr. Liao, talking about uh, the overarching theme here, and that is the massive infrastructure deficit that we do continue to see in the ASEAN region. And whilst that does exist, there are notable cases of success stories here. How do we take these success stories and apply them into the work that needs to be done in the rest of the region? Uh, yes, Adam. Despite the infrastructure deficit in ASEAN, uh, we still can see there is a notable growth as you can see, uh, the ASEAN growth from 2007 uh, GDP from 1.3 trillion up to 2016 is 2.6 trillion. It's nearly double uh, the, the GDP. It's a robust growth. And I would say that this is the age of uh, a Asian as well as uh, certainly for uh, the age of uh, ASEAN. Uh, more importantly, I'm excited. Uh, to see the growth of ASEAN and evenly more excited uh, to see how to unleash the ASEAN uh, economic potential, especially if we can actually uh, really work on the connectivity. We really uh, strengthen the transport uh, infrastructures uh, perspective for ASEAN in the next one or two decades because this will really uh, unleash the ASEAN, ASEAN uh, economic potential. And uh, we can see that uh, through the initiative of AEC, uh, what we launched last year, and this is the first year, uh, through this initiative, we'll be able to ensure that there'll be flow of goods, uh, pass, I mean, in terms of uh, flow of peoples and also many others, uh, uh, intra trade within ASEAN will be able to increase. As you know, uh, ASEAN intra-trade as compared to EU is only about 24%. Mm. Uh, EU is about 60% in terms of intra-trade within the member states, uh, within ASEAN. So this is our challenge and we have to really overcome this and AEC is one of the ways uh, that we come out uh, with good policies for ASEAN, uh, working together as a team, as an ASEAN economic community. Uh, on the infrastructure side, a Minister of Transport from ASEAN, we get together and we have come out with, uh, uh, we call it the ASEAN Transport uh, Strategic Plan. We have the, we, we name it, we, we, we actually decided last uh, year in Kuala Lumpur, then we call it the Kuala Lumpur Transport Strategic Plan mm -hmm. from 2016 to 2025. So that means this strategic plan will be able to transform ASEAN to be a high growth centre. Uh, through infrastructure development. Uh, we talk about land transport, we talk about uh, maritime, aviation, logistics, and also uh, uh, other models of transportation. So uh, it's a very comprehensive five strategic goals to be achieved through this K KLTSP. And uh, we are very, very focused uh, in terms of uh, uh, developing uh, ASEAN uh, as an economic community. So uh, I'm confident uh, with the next uh, 10 years that uh, we will be able to come up with very uh, good connectivity plans. Right. Example, the single aviation market, uh, single shipping market. We talk about KL, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, Kunming Rail Link. Mm -hmm. We talk about how to connect our highways uh, from Malaysia to uh, uh, Thailand as well as any other, all the ASEAN countries. Uh, all this is ready in a plan, and uh, we are focused to carry out all the strategic uh, 
uh, activities. All right, Dr. Liao, thank you very much uh, for that opening statement there. And if anybody would like to respond to that, please do put up your hand. In the meantime, um, you know, you've, you've certainly framed a very optimistic picture about uh, the roadmap for infrastructure development here in Asin. And on that note, I'd actually like to bring you in, Chris, uh, on that, uh, you know, being the head of the Global Infrastructure Hub down in, in Sydney, which is a G20 initiative. I mean, you know, uh, Dr. Liao was talking about some success measures that we've seen in Malaysia beyond some of these Southeast Asian countries. You know, what are the key you know, critical success factors that you've noticed in the ASEAN region and what sort of lessons uh, should be applied to the further development, the further work that needs to be done in the rest of the region? Thank you very much. The, the first point to make is to, to back up the Minister's point, which is that infrastructure leads to growth. So the recent IMF study suggested that for every dollar that's spent on infrastructure, four years later, GDP will have grown by between 1.5 and 2.6 times. Now, these are incredibly powerful numbers when it comes to driving growth into countries. And it isn't really driving growth, it's actually freeing up the growth potential that already exists. Mm -hmm. So infrastructure is a fantastic um, method for stimulating growth. That's the first point. Second point is uh, the, the different forms of infrastructure can be financed in different ways. So every country has within it one pot of, of available finance to spend. And deciding how they spend that finance is incredibly important, both socially, but also economically. And one of the things that we do see in markets is uh, that in markets which are more used to working with the private sector, they become more adept at selecting the projects which are most likely to attract uh, strong economic interest. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, they drive those projects forward faster by driving those projects faster, they unleash some of this growth, which allows them then to undertake other projects. So although private finance and PPP is seen as an expensive way of carrying out infrastructure, it actually brings forward the benefits of infrastructure and makes those available earlier. In terms of best practice, we see some really good stuff going on in the ASEAN region. Um, we see a, a vast amount of political will at the top of governments and we see an understanding of the desire to make uh, infrastructure central to um, countries' needs. And that is a, an incredibly strong starting point. What then needs to happen to really push infrastructure forward in a procurement sense is to clarify some of the structures, the procurement structures that are happening within countries. A good example of this is going on in the Philippines at the moment, where they have put um, in place a single entity to look at how the private sector can help within um, the infrastructure space. This isn't necessarily finance, but it can be. And that entity has been given the power to make decisions on projects that are taken forward and pushing those projects forward. This is difficult stuff because there are already um, ministries in place that want to do these projects. Mm -hmm. But by doing that, you at least look at alternative sources of finance for a project before it goes forward. And that's proving quite attractive to the private sector who are moving into the Philippines quite strongly and has also bought, uh, uh, has actually taken their spend on infrastructure from 2.6% in the past to 5.2% mm -hmm. in the most recent year. And that's a pretty incredible change in terms of percentages of GDP spent on infrastructure. So my, my, my sum up would be political will is in place. There's never enough money for infrastructure. We're looking at a shortfall of about a trillion to a trillion and a half per year on infrastructure globally, and therefore making use of as many different forms of funding that you can mm. is incredibly important. And I guess the last thing I'd say is uh, thanks very much to the ADB who do an awful lot of the work here, create a lot of the structures, and uh, our people who on the ground get things done. Okay, thank you very much for that. And on that note, let's talk about whether the environment is ripe to be engaging in massive infrastructure development in ASEAN. Obviously, the, the region needs it in order to propel these economies. And Steve, I'd like to ask your thoughts on whether this is the right time. I mean, we're looking at a really uneven global economy right now. However, we've got uh, record low interest rates, and if not negative interest rates, and many of the stakeholders I've been speaking to, at least those involved in infrastructure development, say, you know, ASEAN should be engaging, fully engaged right now because interest rates are this cheap. What are your thoughts on that? 
No, I, I, I think you know, there's the, 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 the Chinese saying that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So I think that applies <laughs> here, where we have seen historically an underspend in um, budget allocation towards infrastructure across ASEAN. I think that there has been an awareness that the minister has, has articulated, that Chris has articulated, there has been a development of political will mm -hmm. towards this. But we need to see, continue to see that momentum, and we need to continue to see that investment. Still, we have, you know, in order to close the gap that exists, we need to see close to 9% of, uh, of, of budget allocated towards infrastructure, 9% of GDP allocated towards infrastructure investment. We're seeing some of, we're seeing increases in that spend across many of the ASEAN countries, but still is a lot of variability across the ASEAN countries, ranging from 3% or a little bit less mm -hmm. up to 9% in some cases. So we need to see that, 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 you know, that continued political will, that continued investment. We also need to see you know, continued reforms that are going to create an even playing field that's going to encourage private investment. And again, I think there's a number of examples that we're seeing. We've heard about the Philippines. We've heard about Malaysia. There's some interesting things that are happening in Vietnam at the moment as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's, there is that space for private investment is being created, but we need to continue to see the reforms moving forward. And lastly, and the minister touched on this in the context of ASEAN, uh, but the, the, the opportunity that deeper regional cooperation integration brings for that, I mean, ASEAN as a as a, as a whole um, is 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 a tremendous economic force. ASEAN is, as individual countries, much less so. So I think that the real potential for ASEAN to realize, uh, you know, gr great growth, to take advantage of structural transformation that's mm -hmm. underway in China and elsewhere in the in the in the global economy, is going to only happen to the degree that that integration happens. It's not, as you said in the opening, it's not European style right. integration. It's a different kind of integration. It's appropriate to the region, but that integration is critically important. Okay. You raise a very good point, Stephen, about, uh, you know, structural reform and how that program is or how that progress has panned out in ASEAN in terms of level the playing field here, because I mean, that probably is one of also the big hurdles and challenges. And Nuve, I'd like to bring you in on this, uh, on the other side of the equation from an engineering, uh, you know, consultancy and design firm and really get down to the crux of whether from your side you're actually seeing enough progress in the structural reform in terms of leveling that playing field, especially when it comes to procurement. First of all, uh, I think what is certain is, and the minister pointed it out clearly, there's an enormous amount of demand uh, for infrastructure development. And let's be clear, we typically have transportation infrastructure inside. When we talk about it, there's much more to it to have a holistic view on the infrastructure needed, uh, that is the, the water and wastewater infrastructure that needs to be in place. There's uh, even the social infrastructure that we need to create for a conducive environment for people to live and work in. Uh, what we see uh, as a very encouraging development here in the region, that there's more and more the willingness to adapt the structures and to learn from best practice on an international scale. And I think rightfully it has been mentioned that the Philippines have given a very good example. As a matter of fact, we just, uh, um, Cosette Colinea just joined Atkins. Uh, she was the executive director of the PPP Center to make this expertise available for a much wider audience of clients. But I would add there are other ingredients uh, from an engineering point of view, also from a developer point of view, that are important for that to be successful. The first, I, I basically adding to the criteria that Chris mentioned here. First of all, we need to have a better understanding of the delineation between the risk distribution between the private and the public sector. And if that becomes clearer, what's the task that the public sector, that the government cannot successfully shift to the private part? And what is where the private uh, expertise comes in? Give you an example, uh, kind of the the planning phase of a project is an area where the private sector cannot take on the risk. That is part of the duty of uh, the public room. The second thing, this, uh, which is important uh, according to our experience, again from a worldwide perspective, is uh, that investment certainty has to be improved. There's a lot of money available internationally, and you pointed to the low interest rates and almost to a 
to the difficulty many pension funds have to place investments at the moment. The question is, how do we create enough investable projects out there that are really thought through to the extent uh, that international money can find its place here in the region to be invested? That needs structuring expertise on the one hand side, and it needs this investment certainty that means that the supply chain, once it is geared up, can actually deliver in time and according to budget. Uh, many of you also in the audience might have seen the recent study by McKinsey and colleagues that about 90% of large-scale infrastructure projects on a worldwide basis are significantly above budget mm -hmm. and behind their time schedule. That's a disastrous track record of this industry. Mm -hmm. And that the only way to, to solve that and that's my last point, is embracing technology more. Right. Uh, we all found uh, this book by Klaus Schwab in the conference map about the fourth industrial revolution. In our area, in infrastructure, it is all about digital engineering and embracing the digital revolution in our industry, which arguably has been one of the slowest to innovate. If you look what happened in the telecoms space or in the, in the automotive space, for example, so really thinking through scenario planning a large and complex projects and really collectively with all participants in an infrastructure projects try to optimize and utilize the money available, be it taxpayers' money or be it private money, to the most efficient way possible. That's a task that the industry has to embrace better and we, we will be able to deliver in time and according to budget if we take advantage of what technology and the digital world can create for us today. Well, these are one of the challenges that you've just brought up today in terms of striking that right balance between the public and the private sector in meeting those objectives, and sometimes it's a, a little bit opaque. And you raise the issue of uh, you know, infrastructure projects coming in way above budget. And that is one of the issues that ASEAN has to deal with. And uh, Minister Liao, if I could bring you in on this conversation, because Malaysia has seen an acceleration of infrastructure development projects. And uh, to be honest, uh, many, if not all of them, nearly always come significantly above budget. You know, how can, I mean, Uwe's is talking about the employment of technology in order to make things more efficient. But beyond that, how else do you think governments around the world, including Malaysia, can actually tackle that issue? Uh, first, I must say that the government must keep the policy momentum to grow. As you know that the uh, Malaysian government is very committed to infrastructure development. And we know that uh, even some of the projects is off budget. Uh, some of the projects we have to go for the PPP project, public-private partnership. And we also know the cost of public-private partnership is high, higher than the government funding. Uh, but to ensure uh, sustainable growth, uh, we know we have to keep the economy continue to grow. Uh, we need this infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We need the highway. We need the Pan Borneo Highway, Sarawak Pan Borneo Highway. Uh, we need the double track from Gamas to Johor Bahru to complete the uh, Singapore Kuning Link. Right. You know, we, we need all this budget, but uh, we are committed to this, and that's why uh, we go into some of them is off budget. Mm -hmm. But even that, we are able to sustain our economy growth because uh, we are confident if we do it now, we will be able to reap the economy growth and we will be able to pay off in, in, in the years to come. And uh, looking at the, the budget, that's why we, we are managed to, in terms of fiscal deficit, we, we still control the deficit uh, about 3.1%. 3, 3 and uh, I will say that uh, the government must be committed mm. on infrastructure development and, and we must understand that only through infrastructure transportation development will be able to create more growth. I also agree with what uh, Kruger said that uh, digital economy now is coming in. How the government now, besides uh, the, the real infrastructures uh, development, uh, digital infrastructure development need to be in place uh, for the digital economy to grow. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we've raised some great points here and, and there seems to be in some ways uh, you know, a, a conflict of sort between the priorities and the objectives sometimes when it comes to embracing some of these infrastructure projects. 
I mean, on the one hand, I want to bring you in again, Chris, on this note, because, uh, you know, Uwe made a very good point that, you know, for the private sector to be engaged, that uh, there needs to be, of course, uh, uh, the economic priorities need to be addressed. Uh, you know, they need to be to have a, sort of a guarantee of sorts. And uh, Malaysia has embarked on this road before with, uh, you know, the independent power producers. I mean, how do you proceed with infrastructure development with that kind of model and trying to address the needs on both sides, public and also the private sector? Um, okay, so the, the, the private sector needs the right amount of security to achieve their aims of making a financeable project. Um, apologies, maybe, but uh, they will always want more security. We've seen interesting models where, um, where an initial position taken by a country has then been eroded back to a more economically efficient position. So if you look at um, the Korean model, the Korean Republic, when they started out in their, in their push to use private finance, their early projects were very heavily government guaranteed. And as the private sector became more aware of the strengths and weaknesses of working with that country, became more capable of working in that country, as the country began to understand better how um, to work with the private sector, the trust began to grow and the government's guarantees dropped away slowly until they came down to a much more reasonable balance of risk and return between the two. So government has an important role to play. They are the people who do the planning. Mm -hmm. They are the people who make the priorities. They are the people who provide the environment in which these projects can flourish. The private sector has a whole load of other um, strengths and weaknesses to play with. Government should never forget that they can, at times, play a role to free up projects. Uh, and this is in any country. If you look at the UK, They've recently financed a project called the Thames Tideway Tunnel, which is a 27-kilometer drain under the River Thames. Mm. Now, that's a massive tunneling project, and the government have had the private sector finance and own that project, but the government has taken the final backstop risk on the tunneling risk. So they looked at that tunneling risk and said, this is not a risk the private sector can take, and therefore they decided, as a government, that they would put a single-point guarantee for that specific project risk, and that created a fundable project. So I, I twitch horribly when people say guarantee, because governments guaranteeing the private sector to undertake infrastructure projects is a fairly pointless game, because all of that risk still sits with the government. The cost of the private sector taking part of it is, is you get some benefits from it, but not nearly enough. What you need to be doing is being very smart, recognizing who can hold which risks most effectively, and then making sure that any risks which the private sector can't deal with, they don't have to deal with. So don't try and push toll, pure toll road risk down onto the private sector in a country that has no track record of toll road. Um, it just won't work. You will get nowhere with it. Um, we've recently put out a piece on risk matrices by the Global Hub and by the World Bank together. And uh, I say anybody who's looking at these sort of risks can look there to see an idea of where they should start. Okay. Stephen, you know, I want to bring you in on this, uh, on this note as well. I mean, looking at what the best model is for the rest of ASEAN, um, you know, how do you balance that issue of who, where the risk should fall when you're embarking on these infrastructure projects? Well, I, I think I mean I think Chris did a good good job at sort of articulating that there's you know that there's different kind I mean, obviously there's different kinds and classes of risk that we're dealing with, mm -hmm. but there's also a real difference between what is real risk and quantifiable risk and what is perceived risk, and the degree to which these relationships are built and strengthened, the perceived risk goes down, and so I think that's the role of of you know governments obviously to 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 level playing fields to you know get a better understanding of of what the, what the private sector's impressions and understandings of risk are, but also institutions such as ours or, or, or the, the Global Infrastructure Hub or, or others to help, help private investors understand what the real risks are and play that kind of intermediate role. One point I'd also really like to make sure that we don't overlook is Uwe's point on investable or bankable projects, because we do have a finance challenge to a certain degree across the region or across the globe, mm. but we also have a huge bankable, investable project gap that needs to be addressed. And how we get, get moving on that part of it is, is critically important, because the degree to which we can 
build and identify and, 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 and engineer bankable projects, finance will come. And that might be government finance, it might be private finance, but it needs to have you know, better, better articulated projects at the end of the day. And the last point, one we haven't touched on yet, and this is a specific challenge to ASEAN, is capital market development. Because we also need, um, you know, we also need instruments that can help intermediate finance that's already there. And capital markets, shallow capital markets, which are common across the ASEAN countries, are a challenge to making sure that the finance that's already there mm -hmm. can find its way into these kinds of projects to the degree that they already exist. Okay, uh, Dr. Liao, you know, to what extent is that a big issue for countries like Malaysia that Stephen just raised in terms of deepening and broadening the capital markets as a, as a source of funding to meet the infrastructure needs of Malaysian and the ASEAN nations? Well, we, we, we are able to handle this because uh, our economy is a growing economy. Uh, most important is to ensure peace and stability. You have to ensure that uh, there's uh, enough growth and as well as export must be more than import. And what we are doing now in Malaysia, you can, you can see that uh, although the world economy is uh, into the uncertainty uh, term, but Malaysia is still grow at about 4% to 5%. So as long as we can ensure that it's economic growth, uh, we'll be able to expand and further deepen our capital market. We'll be able to get uh, good rates for our, our loan, yeah. And if I may, I, I think that the, the minister is absolutely correct when, when we're speaking about just Malaysia. Yeah. But I think the challenge is, is that Asia as a whole, ASEAN specifically, is a capital surplus region of the world. Where, are, where is that capital going? That capital is going to low-yielding treasury securities in the U.S. and in the Eurozone to a certain degree. That's a, you know, a flight to safety. There's all sorts of reasons why that happens. But that's why we, you know, there's been, uh, over history, of course, great progress in, in, in Malaysia and some other countries. But we need to expand that across, more broadly across ASEAN countries as a whole mm -hmm. because the degree to which we can you know, bring that finance back into the region is going to help propel this infrastructure investment over time. All right, we have a, 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 a question from the audience in the back over there uh, who wants to raise an issue. And if we could just uh, get the gentleman to stand sure. up there. Yes. Uh, my name is Mark DeSmith. I'm CEO of an asset management firm, Point72 Asset Management here in Asia. I just wanted to pick up on this point because a day doesn't go by in the newspapers where we hear about the low yields and the struggle that retirees are going to have given that traditional fixed income instruments, to your point, are now yielding next to nothing. And it seems like infrastructure is an ideal alternative to that. They're, they're long dated in nature. They're often price adjusted so to, to, to encounter sort of inflation. So I wonder whether the left hand or the right hand in governments are talking to each other about this. The, you know, the retirement system is talking to the transport ministry or other areas, you know, in order to facilitate um, the right outcomes for both the country in terms of infrastructure and retirees and savers in terms of planning for their long-term future. It seems like this is a real win-win situation, but I don't hear a lot about the coordination in government that's taking place to facilitate that. Who would you like to direct that to, uh, maybe, the minister? Maybe to the minister, and, and I'd be interested in Mr. Kruger's uh, viewpoint on that as well. But I would like to respond to that because uh, definitely the government have to consider this, uh, the whole operating uh, fund. Uh, have to ensure that the budget uh, is uh, for all uh, the citizens. It cannot just focus on just infrastructures and forget about other development. But as I've said for Malaysian, uh, for our budget last year. Uh, we placed about 8.5 billion on, on transport uh, development. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more than 10% more than of the whole thing, but we also uh, cater for other needs. But one, when we put this budget on, on transportation uh, development, infrastructure development, uh, we, we know that this will give more returns to us in, in the very near future and uh, we create more economic growth, and uh, at the end of the day, we should be able to benefit the, the people, the rakyat in, in Malaysia. And, and that's how we manage our fiscal deficit, and, and we, are very, we, we have to be sure that uh, our growth will uh, surpass the, uh, the, the pressure that we face uh, for the loan that we, we take. 
So uh, I would say that uh, uh, Malaysia is, is fortunate that because we are a uh, very resource countries and uh, we have a lot of uh, what are called connectivities to the world and uh, in the center of the ASEAN. And as ASEAN as a whole, I reply to what uh, Grof said just now, although ASEAN, there are some deficits in, in certain parts, but uh, as a whole, we know that uh, uh, that will create a lot of opportunities uh, for the people in ASEAN. And uh, connectivity will enhance uh, economic growth, especially after China launched the uh, One Bad One Road. And that actually uh, create uh, connectivity between ASEAN and China, ASEAN and other parts of the world, ASEAN and EU. And, and this actually expand our, our scope. You know, we are not just looking at Malaysia as alone. We are alone. We are looking at ASEAN. We are looking at China. We are looking at EU through all this connectivity. So uh, once the market is big enough, so we are not worried about the investment that we put in. You know, we know that investment that we put in will be enough. We'll get enough returns from all this uh, market that we that's open up now. Okay. You know, AEC with a with a TPPA that we signed, and as well as. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. all this will actually create the kind of impact on our economy. So we have to get ready ourselves. ASEAN must, must be ready for all this infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. Uh, if, if we are not ready, then we will not be able to tap this uh, economy. We will, we will not be able to, to garner and harness the strength uh, that we have in, in ASEAN. That's why AEC is very important. Uh, that's the reason why I say that I'm very excited to see that the next, ten, the next decade, how ASEAN transform its transportation infrastructure's perspective. Mm -hmm. Uwe, could we bring you in and to respond to, to what the member of the audience just said as well? I think it's an excellent question, and I, I believe there are two aspects to it. Uh, the one is that Stephen already alluded to uh, what we need is a further liberalization of uh, the investment vehicles that can be uh, addressed. So bonds are not the only way to look at infrastructure, infrastructure finance, and if there were more opportunities, you would see more international uh, pension funds investing into these infrastructure opportunities, because it's exactly as you say, in an in a extreme low yield environment, infrastructure all of a sudden is the star for investments into long-term assets, so it's a fund fundamental opportunity that we are facing here at the moment, not only for Asian funds, but also for international ones investing here. The flip side, as, as Stephen and I mentioned uh, uh, now before, is uh, we need to carefully look at what is investable. So it's not about uh, coming up with a, with a laundry and wish list of iconic projects that would be nice to have uh, for this kind of money to be attracted, because also the responsibility that these funds have uh, to adhere to, it needs to be really a good investment case to be made. That needs a lot of financial structuring that has to come in, in the first place. And it needs the clear commitment and the believability that the structural and legislative framework that is being set in place is stable. So it's surviving kind of the next election period or whatever it might be. And if the capital market believes in that, be it a domestic one or an international one, you will see much more capital being available. Well, Stephen, can I bring you back in on this conversation? Uh, because how does uh, one approach that issue and challenge of uh, plugging the funding gap here? I mean, you know, Uwe just made a great point in terms of, uh, you know, having to outline the investable projects and what makes sense economically, obviously. But I mean, you know, there's no shortage of funds out there. I mean, it's true. The savings rate around Asia is very, very high. I mean, we're sitting with hundreds and hundreds of billions of US dollars sitting in these pension funds. And, you know, we're in an economic time where governments are all too eager to get these pension funds to, to, to lever up or at least to take a little bit more risk onto their balance sheets. Why has it so, been so difficult to actually tap into that source of funding? Because, I mean, if you have an implicit guarantee from the government, there shouldn't really be a problem. Well, I think it, it comes down to incentives at the end of the day. And the incentives, I think, you know, are... Are, are, are problematic when it comes to, uh, you know, governments to a certain degree and certainly when it comes to institutions such as my own. I think we have a high-level political commitment to this. I think there's no question that ASEAN leaders recognize the need for infrastructure investment. They recognize the need to create a level playing field that will crowd in private investment into infrastructure. So all of this, I think, is well understood at the, at the 
at the political level, and it's well understood, you know, at the management level of institutions such as my own. I think the challenge comes at how do you translate that political commitment into design and execution at lower levels within governments or within institutions that are making these or that are helping, you know, design these types of investments. Because still, what you have is you have, we mentioned the challenge about budgets and that we need to increase the budget spend um, across ASEAN on infrastructure. And yet, there are challenges to even, even if they're only having 5% budget allocation mm -hmm. towards infrastructure, 5% of GDP allocated towards infrastructure investment, a lot of the governments are struggling to, to make that investment at, at 5%. And so much less if you're trying to say, well, also crowd in the private sector here. So then you have a staff of you know, line ministries that are struggling to spend the budgets they already have, mm -hmm. plus they're now expected to design projects that are going to crowd in the private sector. So I think that we need to get incentives in place that recognize the need for this kind of, the, mm. the design of these types of projects, which are going to be of a different gestation period. They're not the same as a, as a, as a standard uh, road investment or road design. It's, it's a different kind of animal, so we need to look at those incentives. We also need to look at skills also. We haven't talked about skills here, and this is also where we see gaps across the region, is that you need to be looking at in, investing in, in skills upgrading across the board when it comes to this, because we don't necessarily have the expertise or experience that we need across the region in order to make, design, and develop, and, and execute these kinds of projects. Okay, it sounds like it's a very complicated process to reach, to reach that happy uh, medium or equilibrium. Chris, you know, what are your thoughts on this? Because, uh, you know, we're talking about the right incentives that need to be provided for the right kinds of, of projects. So what is the best way forward uh, when governments around the ASEAN region look to embark on this? Because certainly there, there, there's a case to be made that uh, perhaps some infrastructure projects that have been implemented in certain emerging markets mm -hmm. may not have an economic case, and yet, you know, people, governments still embark on these projects. So, you know, does this mean that ultimately, at the bottom line, the governments are just going to have to guarantee something? Gosh. Um, the, the point about project selection is, uh, is a huge one. Uh, you can look in Spain and see the Don Quixote Airport, which is a four billion euro airport, which they've just sold for 40 million because it was built in the wrong place with no con connections and it was never ever going to attract any use. Mm. So people do make mistakes and those mistakes are really dire for economies. Working out a selection criteria, making that selection criteria live longer than a single government, making decisions that are based upon a long-term economic view of where a country is going are all essential parts of gaining that multiplier I was talking about to start with, the 1.5 to 2.6 mm -hmm. times. Choose the wrong projects. Infrastructure is highly destructive. So that's the first thing. Moving to a guarantee, the worse projects a government selects, the more likely they are to have to guarantee them. So if you look at a well-selected, well-thought-through project which has strong economic rationale and potentially also links into hard currency for current countries where the bond markets are thin, that is the sort of project which you can, I'm going to say relatively simply, there's no such thing as relatively simply in infrastructure, that you can take to the private sector and can be funded. If you look at something which is um, a stadium, I financed Wembley Stadium in the UK many years ago, so I, I, I have to say I'm a hypocrite on this. But if you took something like a stadium, that's much harder to finance. It's much harder because actually there isn't the same economic return on it that you need. Mm -hmm. So project selection is cr critical. But the second thing is you've got each of these different government ministries who has their budget to spend their money. They have a certain amount of capability. They have a certain number of projects. If, they, if their default is to procure the easier projects, then you will get less and less financeable projects going to the private sector. So there is a mindset change that is needed. And I'm not pointing the finger at any particular country here. It's a, a general point. There is a mindset change that is needed within ministries to say, can I get this done without spending my pot of money? Nice. Because if I don't spend my pot of money on this port or airport, mm. then I have it available to build a school or a hospital or a toll road. So we have, a, we have something of a low-hanging fruit problem going on. And the question is, okay. where do you want to spend your incredibly hard-fought 
tax dollar. Do you want to spend it on a port or do you want to spend it on a school? This is the sort of decision making that has to happen and it is incredibly hard. It is very different to the way things are done normally and have been done in the past. And it takes a great deal of political courage as well. Yes, well actually it's interesting you raise that because uh, you know one example of the success of course is Singapore and many people yes. say that uh, you know Singapore's track record for infrastructure development is second to none um, but you know there are different challenges that uh, the other ASEAN nation face. On that note I believe uh, we have Mr. Yo Kit Siang who's from the Economic Development Board of Singapore that would uh, like to interject and actually pose a question to our panel speakers today if Mr. Yo could, oh there we are. Welcome Mr. Yo. constantly investing in infrastructure, despite the fact that we're a small country, or maybe because we're a small country, we're looking to see how we can continue to optimize it. And I, uh, well, maybe I can offer three points I think may be useful. The first is in terms of how the projects are structured and the public-private partnerships. Um, the minister is probably familiar, water is a very important yeah. resource for Singapore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we are constantly looking to see how we can improve the infrastructure. <coughs> and we're supported companies to in fact innovate around technologies related to water reclamation with the intent that they can build it in Singapore, mm. showcase it and then commercialize it from Singapore. So I think that's one. And we're happy to share our experiences and models in terms of what we've learned, what mistakes we've made. That would be one perspective. The second would probably be uh, project financing. And in 2012, uh, we launched a vehicle, which is backed by the Singapore government, to provide uh, long-term financing for infrastructure projects from Singapore-based companies in the region. I think that's our small contribution in the perspective. It's not in the trillions of dollars, but it's a small contribution. Um, and the third, related to the point that I think Stephen made, was about talent. And two years ago, together with the Singapore Management University, we created a program to train infrastructure leaders. So project financing, project development, and we certainly welcome participants from the region, both from the public and private sector. And I think those three, structuring, um, financing, and talent, are probably the co critical components that will help us come some way towards addressing the infrastructure gap. Okay, thank you. Um, Uwe, I'd like to bring you in now, because you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the big enablers is technology and embracing that to uh, you know, achieve a sort of efficiency there. And Mr. Yeo, they're talking about the skill sets as well as Stephen addressing that. And you know, from your perspective as a design from consultancy engineering, uh, you know, what more needs to be done with uh, some of these ASEAN countries? I mean, Singapore obviously is best in class when it comes to infrastructure, but you know, are you seeing enough of, of uh, development on that front in the rest of the ASEAN countries, and how can that be facilitated? Let me put that in perspective for a moment, again, probably with one statistical piece of information. Um, if uh, um, you look back the last 30 years, typically all industries around us have increased productivity by something in the range of 40, 50, 60 percent. Uh, in construction, be it now uh, residential real estate, commercial real estate or infrastructure, this curve has been flat. So we have not captured the same kind of efficiency gains in this industry. And even if you look at the, the things that you can observe by just looking out of the window, uh, we build buildings today pretty much in the same way we did 50 or 80 years ago. It's embarrassing. And uh, it's only the last two, three, four years that that has massively changed. And it is because of the advent of digital engineering and digital te technologies. So the capability today, not only to do 3D engineering, which we've done for, for quite a while, but to have a fourth and fifth dimension, which is time and cost as well. And if you have this kind of holistic digital model of an asset that you are designing, engineering, building eventually, then of course you have numerous ways to try to optimize that before the first shuffle goes into the ground and hence save a lot of money in doing so with all the stakeholders and all the supply chain elements being in place. And it, that has, of course, a couple of prerequisites. The one is skills, as, uh, as Stephen and uh, our colleague from the EDB just uh, highlighted. It, all, it requires a completely different breed of engineers and, and experts and financial structure, structuring coming together in these enormous projects with enormous complexity to master these models that we can create today. And if you think about it, 
The additional advantage is that you not only optimize the capex to build this asset, you can now think about how do I optimize the opex, so the costs that occur in the lifetime of that infrastructure asset or building that I'm creating, which by the way is 80 or 90 percent of the cost uh, from a total cost of ownership perspective. So enormous opportunities that we have uh, today that we haven't had or we haven't utilized mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of years ago. So that's where I see an enormous optimization potential that we need to embrace as an industry. And that will deliver exactly what I mentioned before, this cost and time certainty that is needed to attract more private money in this industry because we can for sure say uh, after the end of a planning and design phase, this is how we delivered, this is what it cost, and this is uh, when we actually can hand over the mm -hmm. asset uh, for public use. And that will make a huge difference. Thank you. Uh, we've got another six or seven minutes left with today's, uh, this afternoon's panel discussion. So this will be a great opportunity to open it up to the floor. So if anybody has any questions or observations uh, they would like uh, to talk about, please put your hand up and uh, your name. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, panelists. My name is Sandra Wu uh, from Koksai Kogyo. Our company is also heavily involved in the infrastructure. Uh, we all understand uh, building the infrastructure is good, essential to stimulate the economy. My question is to minister and the panelists who would like to uh, answer. Because I wonder, we would, we'd like to sh we would like you to share with us your insight while be, uh, chasing for the economic growth, how you address the environmental and the social issue at the same time. One panelist in the morning section just saying that the ecosystem happening in the other country not happening in ASEAN. Maybe you can say something on behalf of ASEAN. And today the topic is learning the best in ASEAN infrastructure. So I wonder whether ASEAN can build up the, our own infrastructure, the, the ecosystem model, and we can showcase the back, best practice to the world. Oh, definitely. I think we have to showcase the international standards. Every infrastructure project in Malaysia, we have to go through the, we call it the EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment, as well as a social impact assessment. It's not just environmental impact. We also look at the social impact to the surrounding people, how it affects changes to their lifestyle and, and, and so on. So we also like to emphasize that uh, uh, we also assess as what uh, Chris said just now, whether which project comes first, you know, whether you want to develop school first or port first. You know. Definitely, we have priorities and everything there's an urgency as well as importance for all the project. And we, we in, in the government, they have to prioritize and the government need to see the return as well as uh, especially uh, uh, how it could impact our economy uh, after the completion of the project. Because these all uh, example the high speed rail that we, have, we are talking about now, Singapore and, and Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur. And this is undergo a tremendous study and, and very immense study and we, we come out with a viable project because uh, most, impo most important that is it will be the economic return and it's sustainable. So that's why every project will go under cruise three years uh, assessment by the government as well as the private sectors. Just to, just to quickly add on that, I think it's, it's, it's a great question and I think we need, we also have to, there's the environment and the social elements here, but we also have to think in this region in particular, which is very susceptible to climate and disaster risk, mm. is, the, is the, the elements of, of, of disaster and climate resiliency that need to be incorporated into these projects um, over time because the cost of you know, having to rebuild something is significantly more than anticipating what, what, the, the, what those impacts might be and changing you know, design such that it is more resilient to those types of impacts um, in the longer run. So this is something that you know, adds cost up front, uh, but is definitely worth it when you look at a life of project uh, total cost. So these are th things that are incredibly important. You know, Sandra made a, a very good point earlier when uh, she was uh, posing that question to Dr. Liao, talking about, um, you know, embarking on these infrastructure projects for economic profit or economic growth. Chris, I want to bring you in on that. I mean, you know, from your observation from the Global Infrastructure Hub, uh, you know, is too much attention being placed on economic profit versus economic growth in when governments around the ASEAN region are, are looking at you know, the feasibility studies for these big, big ticket, very expensive projects? It's a, it's, a very difficult, it's a very difficult area, particularly politically. 
if you um, are seen to be selling off assets or giving assets to the private sector and the private sector are seen to make a lot of, make a lot of money from those, then you stand the risk of being criticized for that. The reality is that what we need to do is to make sure that we link the profit factor in these projects through to the benefit that we get from these projects. If we can't make a case that says we are allowing equity to make a return on this project of X, and that return is buying us cost certainty, delivery of time certainty, mm -hmm. a more innovative view of how the asset was to be created, a better understanding of the full life costing of that asset. If we cannot make the case that the profit is more than offset by the benefits of using these methods, then we should not be following these methods. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we'll be doing at the Hub is looking at the data that needs to be collected wholesale by the MDBs, by the G20 countries, about projects that are operating so that we can actually start making this case on the basis of projects that have been completed rather than some of us saying, actually, we're pretty sure it's right. Okay. We've, we've got a couple of minutes left, so I'd like to take the opportunity to just uh, go around the stage here just to get closing final comments and observations. And what was the most important thing that was learned from today's discussion at the panel? Uh, Dr. Liao, if we could start with you, um, you know, your closing comments and, and what we've all learned from our discussions here today about the path of infrastructure in ASEAN. I must say that uh, ASEAN is ready for further and more uh, transport infrastructure project because we need to uh, enhance economic growth. And one thing is that uh, we also, with the rise of AEC, uh, we need to increase our intra-trade uh, within, within ASEAN countries. So I think uh, this is important, and, and this message is important for all our stakeholders. We have to be committed, and we make, make sure that we are able to connect to the world. Thank you very much. Uh, Uwe, your parting shots? I think it's an exciting point in time with regard to all the infrastructure projects that are being considered. Uh, let me probably at the end make again uh, another point on technology. Uh, as Chris pointed out, there's a lot of creativity coming from the private sector as well that we can utilize better. If you just think about the future of intelligent mobility, driverless cars that we need to realize early in time now as we plan transport infrastructure for the future, make it future-proofing and embrace these new opportunities that technology brings. Digital asset management is another area for that. So I think if we embrace that more and if this partnership becomes more synergistic between the public and the private sector, not only will we attract more money, we will create a much better user experience uh, for our people here on the ground as well, which I think uh, will be applauded by everybody using these assets at the okay. end of the day. Thank you, Uwe. And Chris, can we get a final closing comments from you? Um, I'm, I'm very excited by the, the vision that I am beginning to see for ASEAN, the connectivity uh, agenda that I think will drive ASEAN from being a group of small countries to trading off each other's strengths and becoming a greater whole. I think that's got to be an exciting vision. And uh, I certainly look forward to infrastructure playing a strong part in that. Thank you. Stephen. Thank you. I, I think there's a tendency in these types of discussions to focus on the challenges. And we've spent a lot of time talking about the challenges. Um, but I think there is a huge amount of progress that we've seen in ASEAN over the, over the last 10 years. And there's a huge amount of political commitment. There are reforms underway. We've seen a lot of progress in PPPs across a number of different countries. So there is the will there. There is progress. We just need to continue that momentum. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. And then just to say in conclusion, uh, you know, ASEAN, as Stephen just alluded to, of course, does have a very bright future. There are opportunities out there and certainly lots of challenges, as every uh, nation region has to face in today's world. And I hope through today's panel discussions that uh, all of the stakeholders have got something out of it, an important uh, message there uh, that can put ASEAN on a path for sustainable development when it comes to infrastructure, because obviously we all know that infrastructure is key in igniting and unleashing the economic potentials within the region. We've got enough cases to prove that uh, here. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our esteemed uh, panelists here, Dr. Liao and Uwe Kuga, and also Keith Heathcote and Stephen Dorf. Thank you very much for joining the panel today and also your participation from the audience. Have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you.